What's up guys? Welcome back. In today's video I want to talk to you about something that could be quite boring at first, but hopefully if you bear with me I can try to make this a little bit more entertaining and not so dull. Alright, let's just jump into it. So before me is a stack of plates, and if you watched the vlog from a few days ago, you'll see that these are the same plates that I bought at one stop at one Goodwill right a town south of here. Plates are nothing new. In fact, these type of porcelain plates have been around since the 1700s, and before that, people had basically two options. The first one, if you were wealthy, you had pewter plates. And this pewter was made of lead. And these plates had a habit of making people sick, especially when people ate highly acidic foods. So instead of blaming the plates themselves, because they had no idea that lead was leaching out of the plate and into their food, they decided to blame the tomatoes. The poorer people who couldn't afford pewter, they had what was called trenches. And trenches were either made out of very hardened bread or wood. The bread was very similar to like today's bread bowl. Like if you go to Panera, you get a bread bowl that's basically it, maybe a little bit harder and not so domed. The wood ones, if you were unlucky enough to have a plate made out of wood, the porousness of the wood allowed for rapid growth of bacteria. And this bacteria would lead to mouth sores. And this is actually where we get the term trench mouth. So back to these plates. You know, just like I do, you can walk into any Goodwill, Savers, or the like, and you can find hundreds of plates. It's one of the most overlooked items in Goodwill. And for good reason. No one likes to ship them, including Goodwill, which is probably why they are still on the shelves. So, on the topic of shipping, it really isn't that difficult. In fact, it is one of the easier items to ship. Dimensions are relatively uniform except platters. But platters are so valuable that it really doesn't matter and it just makes sense to learn how to ship them. Personally, I like to go around the plate a few times with 3 8 bubble wrap and then one time around with 3 quarter. And then I just shove it in a 13 by 12 by 3 priority mail box and away it goes. It's simple. I've heard a lot of people complain, but honestly, it's that easy. At least it's not a soup terrain. But prices for those, I'm, I, it doesn't even matter to me. I'll be gladly wrap up a soup terrain and ship that one out for the amount that you can get for those. One more thing is that plates, they are not, they're not going to be flying off the shelves. These are long tail items. But at $1.99, you can easily get 10x, 20x, 100x of your money. So you can see by the numbers, it totally just makes sense. So let's get into these plates as a quick example of what can be found on any given day out thrifting. So first thing to know about thrifting China is it's way more of an art and the science comes in after you get home, right? You're gonna look at these things and you're just gonna get a feeling. You're gonna see what's cool. If you like the pattern, pick it up. You're gonna know what's, what's gonna look old to you. So let's look at this first plate. From first look, you can tell that it has seen some days, right? The colors are dull, the white is more of an off-white. Crazing, you know, tiny little cracking, you can see. Let's see if I can... This one's actually pretty well done. But crazing, are tiny little cracks in the glaze that are visible. And the theme is much more ornate than you'd find today in many modern plates. A quick look at the back shows Johnson Bros. So my first step would be to, once I got home, would be to check replacements.com. They're a great reference for pattern identification, and sometimes you, they can even help you date the piece. Luckily, the pattern as well as the patent is stamped on the back. Otherwise, we would have to search through 26 pages of Johnson Bros patterns. Some, some makers have more, some makers have less, but this would be a nightmare if it wasn't stamped on there because it's very tedious. You gotta go through all the patterns, but it's, I mean, it's still doable. This pattern is known as Edgeville, and the patent dates to 1899. So although the patent date can be a little loose since it was a patent on the plate and not the pattern itself, but it still gives us something to go off of. All right, this next plate is a rather unusual example of a relatively common pattern. See here. The pattern is Tower by Copeland Spode. What makes this piece not so common is the coloring. More common examples are maroon or a solid blue or even a multicolored that's more brown. A quick look at the back tells us that the plate was made after 1890, and that's when the name Spode was added to the mark. But further dating is difficult based on the other patterns. I would date this between 1890 and 
the early 1930s. That's a big window for sure, but given the unique coloring, it doesn't make as big of a difference in regards to price. This 19th century plate is the outcome of increased Asian trade by Dutch merchants in the 1850s and, and 60s. A look at the back tells us the name of the pattern is Tonquin, along with the Asian-inspired logo. The other mark is B&L, and that refers to Burgess and Lee, which was a company in England started in 1862. If you look at the logos from past to present, this will give you an inclination that this plate here is an older piece, likely 1870s through the 19, the early, very early 1900s. But either way, I mean, look at that plate. That is just absolutely, absolutely stunning. This next plate might not be as old, but equally beautiful is called Singapore Bird. And it was made by Adams, a company that dates back to 1769. This pattern was done at different times in history, but a quick look at the back shows the mark is the older mark, dating in here, dating to the 1920s. The next plate was a little harder to track down, given that the mark on the back was very poor quality when it was first put on there. You can see it's the names kind of falling off the edge. And the only legible word, so the only legible word is university and what appears to be JR. So a quick Google search of University JR plate blue comes up with an answer pretty quickly. And so the first one up is an eBay listing, but you don't really, you want to be careful when you're using eBay listings. You don't want to use somebody's eBay listing as gospel. You want to use it as more of a guideline to find another reference point because a lot of people, they're just like you and me and they're just, they, you know, you don't want to be just take the first answer and then roll with it. So it's important to get that second part of the info. And so you take you take the name that's given there, you do a little search of the hallmarks. So the name was John Ridgway. Do a little Google search on John Ridgway, logos, marks, you come up with an answer. We can see that the maker's mark and the corresponding dates plate this place, place this plate being made anywhere between 1841 and 1855. So that is pretty unbelievable that this plate has been around since the Civil War and it's in great condition. I mean look at this thing. There's, there might be one tiny chip. Actually there's one tiny chip there and that's barely a chip there but just absolutely stunning. I mean it's just it's bananas really. Um, so it's pretty safe to assume that that plate has been around for nine generations. Nine generations have housed that plate until it wound up in my hands. How many dinners did that see? You know? How many awkward moments during family gatherings? <laughs> I mean, it's anything like my house, quite a few. We can only assume, though. This is one of the reasons why I love finding China. The history there. Few things mean more to people than time with family. And where do we spend most of those times? It's usually sitting at the dinner table. Just like this. Last but not least is the hardest to figure out. That's this guy. As you can see, there's no maker's mark. The only thing that we can see is the fiery marks and the pattern on the front. From the pattern, we can safely assume that it was inspired by Amari style plates. Amari refers to the colorful Japanese ware exported to Europe in the, in the 17th century. Typical colors are blue underglaze, followed by red and gold, blue typically being darker and red being more of an orange color. I would go ahead and date this anywhere between the late 1800s and the early 20th century. So that was, that was just one day of looking for plates, right? And I wasn't even looking for plates, but I definitely don't, I don't shy away from them. I'm not worried that I'm going to break them or anything like that. These things are pretty robust. They've lasted for 150, 180 years as one plate. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Um, so I hope this has been insightful. And hopefully your next trip, you won't be hesitant about China. Uh, if there is one thing I learned in the past 10 years, that it is all about how much you know. You need to be just a little bit more knowledgeable than the people that are placing the prices on these goods. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you're new, please hit the subscribe. It really does help grow the channel. 
Also, any feedback in the comments where you agree, disagree, or just want to add something, it's all appreciated. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Holy shit, is it hot in here or what?